So we hear a lot in the media, and even if you don't watch television regularly, somehow it seems to still filter down to us. And you can get a lot of misinformation through the media. Um, there's a campaign that went around a while back called What a Body Needs. And so I thought that I would bypass the propaganda, the promotions that we get in the media, and talk about what a body truly needs, um, and get it, getting it from research. Everything that I've shared with you is strongly research-based. I don't share anything with you that I don't find a very sound study to back up, to support. So I'm going to share with you what the research says about what a body needs this afternoon. But first, just want to say another quick prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we ask for your spirit, especially right now, to give us discernment. Help us to understand what you have provided for us to take care of this marvelous organism you have created. Help us to be good stewards, please. And we do pray that you'll give us wisdom and understanding. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. What a body needs. So dairy products have been heavily promoted in the media as a health food, as a help for weight loss, and definitely, most significantly, as something that we want to use to make sure that our bones are strong. Children need to drink milk because it builds strong bones. And milk is a natural. Milk is a natural. And that's true. All mammals were meant to drink milk from their mothers until they were weaned. So goats, milk for goats. Pigs, milk for pigs. Dog, milk for baby dogs, zebra milk for baby zebras, cow's milk for baby cows, and human milk for baby humans. Unlike other mammals, though, humans continue to drink milk after they're weaned. Most mammal, most little baby mammals will drink milk for a, a short period of time and then they're weaned and they don't continue to drink milk from their mother. We had a horse and it had a baby while, while we owned it and the baby nursed for I think about 16, 18 months or so and then every time that, and the baby was, it was a Belgian so they were huge horses and the baby was huge and he was still trying to nurse from his mother and his mother was like, you know, after about 18 months, you're done. We're, we're done weaning. I mean, we're done with milk. It's weaning time. But we haven't taken the, the cue, apparently. Um, we continue to drink milk after we're we weaned. But not only that, we are drinking the milk of another species. Maybe that's not so natural after all. The milk of a particular species is specifically designed by our creator for that species. Human milk is designed for humans. Cow's milk is designed for cows. Goat's milk is designed for goats. That's just the way it is. It's pretty logical, but we seem to be missing this message. And the fact that we're drinking milk of another species is actually causing problems, health problems in the, in the human species. In fact, there are hundreds of studies conducted in countries worldwide and, and a large number of large randomized trials that have shown the same thing, and that is that the more milk we drink, dairy milk that we drink, the more problems that we're going to have, health problems. The studies show that drinking dairy milk contributes to heart disease. The enzyme, an, an enzyme that's in cow's milk, actually attacks 
the heart's arteries, and this contributes to heart disease. But that's not the only problem with dairy milk as a, concerning heart disease. In addition, dairy products are generally high in fat, and they, are, they don't have any fiber at all. Remember, we learned that all plant foods have fiber, and there is not one single animal, animal food that has fiber. So we've got high fat, no fiber, and that high fat, no fiber diet contributes to heart disease. But then researchers started to notice something really interesting. They noticed that when they did studies, those, on the, those who were consuming skim milk or very low fat milk got heart disease almost, not quite, but almost as much as those who were consuming the, the regular fat milk, the high fat milk. And this really puzzled researchers because they assumed that it was the lack of fiber and the high fat that was causing the heart disease. So this puzzled them until they did more studies, studies and they discovered it's not only the fat in the dairy milk that is harming and causing heart disease, but it's also the milk protein and the lactose and that enzyme that contributes to heart disease. Strep throat is another condition that is caused by consumption of dairy products. Dr. Frank Oski, the chief of pediatrics at John Hopkins School of Medicine, this is what he says. I have never seen a case of strep throat in a child who has not had exposure to milk in the previous five days before developing strep throat. Dr. Baggett agrees. He says the streptococcus germ will not, under ordinary circumstances, establish an infection in a child kept on an absolutely no milk protein dietary regimen. Any time a patient of mine is found to have streptococcal pharyngitis, we can establish by history that he has ingested milk protein within five days prior to onset of symptoms. A definite connection there, and the research backs up what these pediatricians say. Cancer is another disease that's associated with the consumption of dairy products. Researchers have found that casein, which is a milk protein, actually promotes cancer growth in all stages of development, the initial stages right up to the end stages. It promotes cancer growth. Here's one study that was published in the American Journal of Epidemiology, and it found that drinking more than one glass of milk a day gave women a 3.1 increased risk of ovarian cancer compared to those who didn't drink milk. There seems to be a dose-response relationship to dairy consumption um, and prostate cancer. In fact, Dairy consumption is the single most um, indicator of whether someone will get prostate cancer or not. Men with the highest dairy intakes have approximately double the risk of prostate cancer, up to a fourfold increase in the risk of fatal prostate cancer compared to those who don't drink milk. Leukemia is another um, very sad uh, disease that is caused by the consumption of dairy products. The bovine leukemia virus, it's a virus, it's found in three out of every five dairy cows um, in developed countries. And pasteurization doesn't disable many of the viruses, including this one. As a result, childhood leukemia is higher among those who consume dairy products. Here's a large study from Norway that was published in the Brit British Journal of Cancer, and they found that if individuals drank two glasses of milk or more a day, or the equivalent in dairy products, it doesn't have to necessarily be milk, the odds were 3.4 times greater than in pers persons drinking less milk of developing lymphoma. Diabetes is another disease that is connected with dairy consumption. Researchers published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition and found, um, research that was published there, found a significant positive correlation between dairy consumption and the development of diabetes, insulin-dependent diabetes. 
and non-insulin dependent diabetes they think is connected with milk consumption as well. Allergies, even allergies are affected by dairy consumption. There's a doctor, his name is Dr. Craney. He used to be, I think he was the president at some point, I don't know, maybe he still is, of the Ontario Allergy Society or something like that. So when a patient comes to him with an allergy, before he do, does anything, he tells him, I want you to go home and stop using all dairy products and then see how you feel and then come back to me. He doesn't do anything for them. He just tells them to do that. So they go home and hopefully do that, or maybe they find another allergist, I don't know. Um, but 70% of those who stick with him come back and they say, I feel fantastic, I don't need any other treatment. The removing the dairy products from the diet worked. Asthma, very strongly connected to dairy consumption, especially in children. So one study placed asthma patients on a milk-free and meat-free diet. So no meat, which includes fish, chicken, and so forth, and no dairy products at all. The result was that in four months, 71% of them had a, a significant relief in their asthma, significant improvement. But after a year, 92% of them felt better. So apparently it maybe takes some time to feel the benefits, but a huge improvement for these asthma patients. Dr. Baggett, who is a pediatrician, he started to recognize the connection between asthma and dairy products. And so he started recommending to the parents of his little patients that, who had asthma that they take them off of, take the child off of dairy products. And before he started recommending this, Many of his patients had act active asthma. After this, none, none, no patients with active asthma. But interestingly, he found some other benefits that just kind of came along with it. He used to refer 100 patients a year to the hospital after the no milk program, only 12 to 14 patients a year. And four appendectomy cases a year were pretty common for him, now zero. Digestive issues are also very common with the ingestion of dairy products, and that makes total sense because we're drinking the milk of another species. It wasn't created for us to drink. And so some of the most common digestive issues are irritable bowel syndrome and constipation, but a number of issues can be relieved by removing milk from the diet. Eczema is also a common issue among those who use use um, dairy products. There is a hormone that's given to cows that it is actually the culprit here. And psoriasis is very common. Um, I know a man who had very severe psoriasis and his wife wanted him to try a, a dairy-free, uh, give dairy-free a try to see if it relieved his psoriasis. But he, he didn't, he had tried uh, dairy-free milks and he didn't like them, and so he's like, I don't want to do this. But she really wanted him to get relief from them. He had very terrible psoriasis. So what she did is when she, she did the grocery shopping, she bought his milk. Um, it was from the U.S., so it was a half gallon of milk. And she also bought some non-dairy milk. And she took, the first time, she took a quarter cup of milk out of his dairy milk and put a quarter cup of the non-dairy milk. I think it was rice milk in which... I don't know why she used rice milk, but anyway. Um, so she put a quarter cup of rice milk in there, put it in the fridge, and so when he poured it on his cereal, he ate it, and of course he didn't taste anything, because that's just a really small amount. You're not going to taste that. So the next time she bought milk, she took a half a cup out and put a half a cup of rice milk in. Gave it to him, such a small amount, he didn't taste it. The next time she did a cup of the rice milk, and... I don't remember if it was at a cup or a cup and a half, but anyway, one day he was, tasted his cereal and he, go, he said, honey, is, the, is there something wrong with the milk? And she said, oh yeah, it's fine. I just bought it. It's fresh. So he ate it. And, this, and then, so then she realized that was the cue to 
kind of ease off for a little while. So she stuck with that cup and cup and a half or whatever it was for a few months because there's an actual physiological occurrence that happens when you're learning to like a new food. There's a little thing in your brain called a taste center and which original, huh? <laughs> um, anyway, it, it, the more you eat a food, the more your taste center comes to be like used to the food. It, it, um, it accustoms itself to that taste and it tells your tongue to be okay with that taste. So she knew she had to kind of, she had to get the milk in him, but not so much that he could taste it. And that taste center was doing the work. So she waited a few months at that level and then she started adding, you know, doing the switch more and more and more. I don't know what she did with the dairy milk. She might have just thrown it down the drain. I don't really know. Anyway, so one day after he's eating all rice milk and no dairy milk at all, um, or it was very, very close, his wife said, so how was your cereal this morning, honey? And he instantly, he was suspicious. He's like, what did you do to my cereal? She said, I didn't do anything to your cereal. <laughs> So anyway, eventually, I don't know how he found out, but eventually he found out, but he liked it by then. So it was just that little gradual thing. And I tell you that story. Oh, and also his psoriasis really cleared up a lot. It didn't totally go away, but it, it's hardly noticeable at all now, whereas before it was very noticeable. But I tell you that story to tell you that if there's anything that I present or that you learn elsewhere about eating healthfully and it sounds challenging to you, that's a wonderful way to get used to lighting, liking new foods without it being horribly painful and difficult. You know, choking down food that you don't like, I don't think is something that any of us need to do. Okay, so psoriasis is greatly helped by a no milk diet. Also, depression is very strongly connected to dairy products. In fact, Dairy is the um, most commonly reported problematic foods in relationship to depress depression. The dairy protein, casein, has been linked to not only depression, but also aggression and anger in many situations. Researchers at UCLA have found that the consumption of dairy product actually changes the way the brain works changes the way the brain works. That's scary. And not in a good way, obviously, because they're struggling with depression and aggression. So uh, another story, I know a man who was depressed ever since he, he said he remembered being seven years old and trying to figure out how he could kill himself. I just can't even imagine that. And by the time I met him, he was in his 30s and he was married and he had two children. Um, somebody told him about the connection between dairy products and depression and he just thought that was ridiculous but he was still struggling with depression and so at some point he got low enough to where he thought it was worth a try he tried it and in one week this man I've ne he was a completely changed man I mean I I had only known him as being depressed so it was remarkable um, and you know there were a lot of marriage problems a lot of difficulties because of his depression and and it was amazing, the transformation, just removing dairy products. Ear infections and sinus infections are very common with the use of dairy products and obesity. I, when clients come to me and they're eating the standard diet of, of junk food and meat and um, cheese and, and dairy products and everything, I have to be careful how, you know, I don't want to push them too hard and make them not you know, feel like they can make so many dietary changes and they just forget it all. So I have to pick and choose which, which food I pick on first. And dairy products is almost always one of the top ones that I do because it makes such a big difference in how they feel. I would let them, let them, I should put that in differently. I would advise them to, I wouldn't say anything about meat. I would say something about dairy products first. So um, cow's milk contains hormones that are secreted from the pituitary of the cow. And one of the purposes of these hormones is to grow a baby cow. And by grow, I mean grow, like gaining 600 pounds or 270 kilos in a very short amount of time. Cow's milk is designed to 
to get that baby growing, a lot of growth, but it isn't designed for brain development. The, brain, the, um, the cow's brain develops much more slowly than does a human brain and not to the extent that a human brain develops. So cow's milk is not a good option for babies if you want a good brain and, and not too much growth. So, but the cows, the, these hormones in the cow's milk it, are designed to get that baby cow growing. And when humans drink cow's milk, it makes them grow too, just not in the right way. But if you're going to leave off dairy products, what about bone health? I mean, don't we need dairy products for healthy, strong bones? If we don't drink milk, maybe we're more at risk of getting osteoporosis. And that's what the media tells us. But again, we don't want to go with what the media tells us because it can tell us anything they feel like. We want to go with the research. So let's look at the statistics for hip fracture rates compared with calcium intake um, around the world. And we'll see what type, type of correlation there is. So here's something that seems to be a bit ironic. Norway has, consumes about 100, what, what is that, 1,000, yeah, about 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day. and their hip fracture rate is quite high. What would that be? Like about 180 or, or so per 100,000 people. But in contrast, Hong Kong, maybe about 300 milligrams of calcium a day, and their hip fracture rates are really low. I mean, that's really ironic, especially if, if dairy products and higher calcium intakes are supposed to help make our bones strong. Singapore. Again, low calcium intake, low hip fracture rates. South Africa is way down there. And we kind of see as we go through here that as the calcium intake increases, so, do the, so does the hip fracture rate. Um, Want to know where New Zealand is? Right up there by United Kingdom. And embarrassingly, we are up there too. And I mean the US. And Denmark. Uh, uh, Australia our way up there statistic so we can see that calcium getting more calcium is not keeping these people from breaking bones um, and in fact countries that have the highest milk consumption actually as you can see statistically have the highest hip fracture rates osteoporosis is rarely found in non-milk drinking countries. In fact, some countries don't even have the word osteoporosis. They don't drink milk. They don't get osteoporosis. It's just not an issue. And even though their calcium intake is like half of what the United States um, has. So could it be genetics? Maybe these people in these countries that don't drink milk just have genetically have very strong bones and they don't need to drink milk. Well, when you take that person from another country, and you give them milk somehow, either by bringing them to a country that drinks a lot of milk, and so they ad adopt the, the culture, or you take milk into that country, either way they're getting more milk, we see osteoporosis rates go through the roof. So genetics are not the issue. According to a study published in the American Journal of Nutrition, Numerous studies show a worsening in calcium balance in women who drink milk every day. So this is what the issue is, ironically. Harvard University's landmark study, they, they studied 78,000 women for over 12 years. So this is a substantial study. This is a pretty reputable study. They found that women who drank the most calcium from dairy foods broke more bones than those who rarely drank milk, up to double the hip fracture rates. And so um, Lunar Osteoporosis Update summarized this study, this one that I just showed you. And they said, this increased risk of hip fracture was associated with dairy calcium, plain and simple. If this were any other agent, if this were an agent other than milk, which has been so aggressively marketed by dairy interest, it would undoubtedly have been considered a major risk factor. But because it's milk, it has not. A 2005 review published in the journal Pediatrics showed that milk consumption doesn't improve bone health in children either. 
So the world leader in, or the United States is definitely one of the world leaders in dairy consumption, only to be topped by oh, New Zealand. Oh, hmm, you drink more dairy. You have more calcium intake than we do. Um, you must be, yes, you're not eating as much sugar as we are, so that definitely helps. You must have a better diet than we do. Anyway, we are definitely one of the world leaders in dairy consumption, and so are you, and yet we have the highest osteoporosis rates in the world, and you're not too far behind. The majority of the world takes in less than half of the calcium than we take and has much, much lower rates of osteoporosis. So we cannot logically say that dairy products um, prevent osteoporosis. So if dairy products don't prevent osteoporosis, then what does prevent osteoporosis and what causes osteoporosis? So I'm going to give you eight things that cause osteoporosis and only three that you have to do to prevent osteoporosis. The first cause of osteoporosis is a high animal protein intake. Animal protein causes the body to excrete calcium. And research backs this up. According to the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, osteoporosis is a disease caused by a number of factors, which I'm going to share with you in a moment. The most important of which, number one, is excess intake of animal protein. So if you remove the animal protein from your diet, you're taking a huge step in preventing osteoporosis. According to the Department of Medicine at the University of California, a high ratio of animal to vegetable protein consumption. So if you're eating, um, if your plate has meat, meat, and a little bit of vegetables, that's a high ratio of animal to vegetable protein. Or if you eat more um, animal protein than vegetable protein. That was found to be associated with increase of bone fractures. According to Penn State University, they did another study where they were trying to find the connection between bone health and calcium intake. And when they summarized this study, this is what they said, consistent with other research, because there's a lot of research on this subject and it is pretty consistent. The study showed that calcium intake, which ranged from 500 to 1500 milligrams per day, has no lasting effect on bone health. So it didn't really matter. They could be eating 500 milligrams of calcium a day or 1,500 milligrams of ca calcium a day. It didn't really matter. And currently, I, New Zealand's recommended amount, recommended intake is about 1,000, and I think the United States is pretty close there. According to the study published in the British Medical Journal, calcium intake is completely irrelevant, irrelevant to bone loss. Osteoporosis is not caused by a low calcium intake. Instead, it's due to a loss of calcium caused by an unbalanced diet, and that's what I'm, those are the factors that I'm going to show you, one through eight. Osteoporosis is not caused by low calcium intake. According to the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, women with the highest ratio of animal protein to plant protein had 3.7 times more bone fractures than the women with the lowest ratio. Okay, are you tired of the research? <laughs> Enough research? <laughs> I'm sure, but the problem is the, the media is so strong in sending this message that I feel like, you know, if, if, if somebody doesn't see that one study after another, after another, after another says the same thing, then we'll kind of just slip back into what we know. So just one more. According to a study of osteoporotic fractures research group, Women with the highest ratio of animal protein to plant protein lost bone almost four times as fast as the women with the lowest ratio. So again, time after time after time after time, the research is showing that the animal protein is the contributing factor to osteoporosis. But there are a few other, so this is the major factor. There are a few other factors, the second one being also very significant, and that is a diet high in phosphates. So we get phosphates from milk, and from chocolate and from alcohol and caffeine, few other, few other sources, but these are the main sources. Okay, so now I have a quiz for you. So put your thinking hats on. I know it's after lunch and everybody's sleepy. It was a delicious lunch, but I have a quiz. I want you to figure this out. So here are the two main causes of, of osteoporosis, high animal protein intake and di a diet high in phosphates. Two greatest causes of calcium loss, 
animal protein and phosphates. What food is high in both animal protein and phosphates? Milk, exactly, all dairy products, actually. And this is why the, the countries that are eating the most calcium, and most of them are getting them from dairy products, have the highest rates of osteoporosis. Animal protein and phosphates that you find in the dairy products contribute to the osteoporosis. So the fact is, if your diet is high in animal protein or phosphates, even if you consume large amounts of calcium, you can take supplements and do whatever, you, you want to do, you're still going to be susceptible to osteoporosis. The next factor contributing to osteoporosis are soft drinks. I'm sure that you all have heard that soft drinks contribute to osteoporosis. Water is the beverage of choice. Caffeine also contributes. One cup of coffee daily causes a 1.4% bone loss. Um, loss of bone calcium per year in women over the age of 50. Now, when I first read this, I thought, oh, that's not very much. But then I got to thinking, wait a second, T multiply that by 10 years, and that's 14% bone loss. I don't think I can afford that. So caffeine is a good thing to be avoided if you want to keep your bones. Alcohol also contributes to bone loss, as well as baking soda and baking powder. This one is something else that's not published very much, even though the research shows that it does cause bone loss. Um, these two substances, baking soda and baking powder, change the pH of the blood. And calcium, thiamine, and vitamin C in the blood are largely destroyed after the consumption of baking soda and baking powder. But they're not too, I mean, you can, instead of, um, I have, most of the time we use baking soda and baking powder in things like cookies and quick breads. And so I have recipes on my website for cookies without baking soda and baking powder. Um, for birthdays, you can do ice cream cakes instead of regular baking powder raised cakes, and nobody's going to complain, trust me. There's lots of other healthier alternatives to these things that are bone robbers. The next factor is a high sugar intake. A little bit of sugar is not terribly damaging, but the problem is that most people eat way more sugar than, that they, than they realize, and this can be damaging to the bones. And smoking. Smoking is not the greatest for your bones. So those are the things that contribute to osteoporosis. But now let's talk about how to prevent osteoporosis, and I think this is so beautiful. God makes everything so simple for us. There are only three things we need to do to have strong bones. The first one is to get outside and exercise. Our bodies were made to work. The large muscles in our legs and the muscles in our arms were not meant to just sit around. We were made to work and to move. And so getting outside every day can um, help us in many, many ways. And one of those is to prevent osteoporosis. According to the British Medical Journal, exercise may be the best protection. Did it say milk? No, it said exercise may be the best protection against hip fractures. Now, these are peer-reviewed medical journals, not just somebody's opinion. Reduced intake of dietary calcium does not seem to be a risk factor. Bone density is also very much affected with, by how much exercise young people get, like in their teenage years. So, I mean, we can, as older, when you're older, you can still benefit from the things that I'm saying, but you get the most benefit if they're applied in your teenage years. Vitamin D from the sun. They've done some research on vitamin D supplements, and they don't, it definitely doesn't have as much beneficial effect as if we get vitamin D from the sun, nowhere close. And the consumption of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. The, the diet that God created for us not only helps us um, avoid disease, helps our brain to be healthy, but also gives us strong bones as well. In countries, in populations where osteoporosis is either rare or completely unheard of, they get their calcium from greens and from whole grains. And they have strong bones. Like I said, osteoporosis is, is almost unheard of in these places. So let's compare calcium con content to some foods here. We have collards, which are a green. When I was 
teaching this in Australia, they said they had never heard of that before. It's a very easy to grow green, and I'm assuming you could grow it here very easily. So collards, collard greens, have 357 milligrams per cup um, of calcium and 61 calories. That works out to 585 milligrams of calcium per 100 calories. Kale has 179 milligrams of calcium per cup and 39 calories. So that works out to 459 milligrams per 100 calories. Now milk, let's compare this to milk. Milk has 286 milligrams of calcium in one cup and 122 calories. And that works out to 237 milligrams per 100 calories. So who wins? The greens win. And because the milk is high in animal protein, that calcium isn't even going to stay in your body. That calcium is going to be excreted through the urine because of the high animal protein factor in that milk. In addition to being fabulous sources of calcium, greens also are loaded with phytochemicals, which have a, a number of health benefits, but milk does not. And again, the, there's no animal protein in the greens, so the calcium you eat is the calcium that's going to stay in your body. And it's also saturated fat-free, so it's not going to contribute to heart disease and, and other health issues, and it's cholesterol-free. So greens win, 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 win. Now, they did some research where they tested groups of people who ate or who drank milk or other dairy products for their calcium and compared, it, compared the blood levels of calcium to those who ate kale for their calcium. So we've got this group of people who's using, who are using dairy products for calcium and this group of people who are using kale for calcium. Now we're not testing osteoporosis, we're just testing blood levels of calcium. And they found that those who ate kale had way higher blood levels of calcium than those who drank milk. And again, it's because that, that calcium gets excreted. And the calcium in milk is more, I mean, sorry, the calcium in kale is more bioavailable to the to the body. If you don't like greens, no worries. You can chop them up really fine and incorporate them into dishes like soups and casseroles and it's a good way, you know, it's like that that little milk trick where she took out some of the dairy milk and put in the other milk. You just hide it in there little by little and, and every little bit adds up. So you get the benefits, but but the nutritional benefits, but you don't have to eat it, you know, taste it if you don't like it. Nuts and seeds are also excellent sources of calcium. Um, one cup of almonds, and I know we don't generally eat one cup of almonds, one cup of sesame seeds, and so forth, but I'm just giving this information to help you to see that there are very good sources of calcium. One cup of almonds contains 378 milligrams of calcium. Chia seeds, 1,400 milligrams of calcium. I really like chia seed pudding, so that's a, a good excuse to eat it. One cup of sesame seeds, over 2,000 milligrams of calcium. So excellent sources of calcium. But how much calcium do we really need? So um, again, in New Zealand, the recommended amount is about 1,000 milligrams of calcium. Um, and I think I have this 1,200 up there from the US, but regardless, it still works. 1,200 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium. However, many researchers believe that this figure is incorrect because it's based on people who eat meat or other animal products. So you've got a high level of high intake of, of animal protein. So the calcium is being excreted. So they want them to eat more calcium. So that's if you eat animal protein. The researchers are telling us that if you eat a whole food plant-based diet, you probably only need like 500 milligrams of calcium. And that is super easy to get. If you eat a few greens or you eat some tahini or sesame seeds and you eat whole plant-based food, as long as you're not just eating a very mono diet, you're gonna get enough calcium. A study, um, oh, that's right. I wanted to tell you, they also have done studies and found that those who eat this lower amount of calcium, their body actually uses it more efficiently. So you're, 
the more is being absorbed and so even in your kidneys conserve it better and so forth so even with the lower amount of calcium you're actually getting more and so what it really all boils down to is the amount of calcium we ingest is not nearly as important as the amount of calcium that our body keeps we want our body to absorb calcium not so much be taking it in you know and just like going through this pipe we need to be making sure that we absorb it and the way to do that is to minimize the animal protein and any other things that inhibit the absorption of calcium you can get your calcium. These are, these are super high sources of calcium. Sesame tahini or sesame seeds, okra, greens, pretty much all greens. This is kale and amaranth leaves. All greens are, have varying source, uh, amounts of calcium in them. And figs, my, one of my most favorite sources of calcium. Again, a, a, an excuse to eat things we like. Um, calcium supplements. A lot of people ask me about calcium supplements. But they, and they do seem to maybe help prevent osteoporosis. The problem is that they also increase your risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke. So I, I don't take calcium supplements. I wouldn't advise anybody to take calcium supplements, especially when you have great food that you can eat instead and not increase your risk of those diseases. So removing milk from our diet is it's not hard to replace the calcium. That's super easy. But then what do you put on your cereal? Well, it's pretty easy these days. When I first removed milk from my diet, there were no almond milks. There were no soy milks. There were no options. So we, I did some pretty disgusting experiments. But it's not so hard anymore. There's a plethora of options out there. The challenge is finding which one you like. That's the first challenge. And the second challenge is um, getting your taste buds used to it. And I've already explained to you a good way to do that little by little. So at breakfast, we use milk on our cereal. And at lunch, we put sour cream on our baked potato or cheese on our pasta. And we eat ice cream for dessert. So we've got, we've got dairy products everywhere in our diet. But it really isn't difficult to replace these things. Again, you can get lots of varieties of milk at the grocery store now, or if you really want to go real healthy, you can make your own milks at home. These are some recipes that I have on my website, coconut walnut milk, coconut Brazil nut milk, um, and yeah, some, just some options there. And then homemade cheeses that are not really cheese, of course, but they're made from plant-based ingredients are also a very good option to replace cheeses. Now, they don't taste like cheese, and you'll love them if you don't expect them to taste like cheese. If you expect them to taste like cheese, you might be disappointed. There are also vegan cheeses in the grocery store, and they are good options in a pinch, but just like the, the non-dairy milks, they're not as healthy as if you make them at home. They're way healthier than the dairy versions. So if that's you know an occasional thing or a stepping stone, perfectly fine. But when you make your own at home, you can control what goes into it. So if you have um, a health concern, or if you're trying to lose weight, then as much as possible, leaning in that direction can be good. Um, so here's my, my mozzarella cheese and my cheese sauce. So it's not hard to go without the, the dairy products. And I don't recommend the, the one thing I do not recommend is the non-dairy ice cream that you can buy in the store. As, as delicious as it, as it is, sugar does contribute to many diseases, including the osteoporosis, and they are loaded with sugar. But no worries, you can make your own smoothies at home. This is a carob smoothie, so we've left out the sugar and the chocolate. So we're doing great things for our bones and um, other kinds of smoothies as well. So you can have the sweetness without all the added sugar. There are many, many foods that are excellent sources of calcium. If anybody, I obviously am not going to be able to take the time to leave these up on the screen, but if anybody wants a list of these, please feel free to email me and I'll send you that list. So we have the perfect diet given to us by the creator, which doesn't involve, involve sneaking into a, a pasture of cows and trying to get the cow to let you nurse off of its udder. It is not necessary for calcium for us to be drinking milk of another creature. We, um, breast milk is fabulous. Human breast milk is fabulous for babies. And 
Um, but beyond that, we, we need to be leaning towards weaning. Um, but God has given us so many other good foods. We don't need that. And all of these foods, these whole plant-based foods, are going to really strengthen your bones, and you don't have to worry about getting enough calcium. All right, let's pray. Dear Father, you are so good to provide so well for us, not only providing all of our nutritional needs, but also making eating food enjoyable and delicious. And we just praise you for your goodness and praise you for your love towards us and for providing so well for us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This program that you have just been watching is available on DVD. You may purchase a copy of this presentation as well as my weight loss DVD by visiting www.autumnleaves.co.nz. That is www.autumnleaves.co.nz. Or you can phone 03-313-7762. Thank you. My name is Jennifer White from jenniferskitchen.com.